We're going to talk about creation. It's exciting. Um, <clears throat> all right, so here we go. Let me see, Rob. Uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll jump right into this. Gracious Father, I pray that you'll help us to understand your word and your creation better and apply it to our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Um, all right, so here's the deal. Haley Wilder, whatever, help yourself, you know, come on up here if you need to. All right, yeah. Um, all right, so we're going to be talking about creation. Now, it's really, uh, in, in our culture right now, one of the things that's fascinating for me personally is that, you know, I want to, uh, I want to help Christians to be confident in Christianity, you know? And, uh, and right now, it's real easy for us to sit back and be like, well, you know, science tells us that there is no God or that everything that came into existence, we don't know how it came into existence and that it just evolved into what we have now, you know? This is what, that's what smart people say. And unfortunately, um, I, I'm afraid that a lot of Christians think that to be academic means to be an atheist or an evolutionist. And I want to I help kind of dispel that this morning and talk about not just um, the Bible, but talk about science. But before we do that, we also need to talk about the Bible. You know, because it's real easy. Again, there's a, there's a push in the Christian intellectual community to accept wholeheartedly um, a a biological evolutionary mindset, and I think kind of as a concession, like giving in to the pressure of the outside world so that it looks like, oh yeah, well, we're at least smart in this area. But there's a big problem with that because when you look at the Bible, you know, if I said this, where do you see creation in the Bible? What would you say? Genesis, right? The beginning. Well, yeah, and that is, you're exactly right. We see it spelled out there. But remember, the Bible is a series of 66 books that are interconnected and that they reference back to each other over and over and over. And what I, what I want to challenge y'all with is as you're reading and studying the Bible, you should try, try to pay attention to the other passages of Scripture that actually look back to that Genesis account. Because you can't just cut out the beginning of Genesis and say, okay, I believe everything else. That first part, well, that's kind of confusing, or maybe it's not literal, or maybe it's just po poetic language. I'm just going to get rid of that, as if that doesn't affect the rest of the, the, rest of the, the story, the rest of the book. So think, about a, um, think about if you have blueprints for a house. Let's say you want to build a house, and you've got blueprints drawn up, and you'd like to have a bigger, you know, bedroom. Can you just change the size of the bedroom? Can you just take the blueprints and say, well, I'd like to just have a bigger bedroom? Well, of course not, right? Because, you know, if you make the bedroom bigger, you're going to make everything else around it smaller, and everything else is going to have to adjust to it, right? Think about the Bible that way. You can't just grab something out of it and take it out because it affects everything else. And so the question is, is, is really, you know, about interpretations. So when we look at Genesis, uh, the beginning of Genesis, this is a question of interpretation. We say that we take the Bible literally, but what does that mean? right? Um, it might be better to say we take it literarily, you know, because the Bible is written in a, buff, a bunch of different genres, and you don't translate genres the same way. But the real question is, how are we supposed to interpret Genesis 1 through 11? And even more than that, what is God trying to convey? You know, because when we look at Genesis, the beginning of Genesis, it looks like they're trying to tell us how the world began. The clearest meaning, the clearest interpretation is this is the beginning of the universe, so much so that, I mean, Genesis means beginning. So then our question is, how, how is Genesis 1 through 11 supposed to be taken? Is it supposed to be taken as history? And the reason why I say 1 through 11 is because this is kind of the disputed, uh, disputed text, right? The, Genesis, the creation and the early history of the, wor of the world, right? So is it supposed to be taken as history? And I would say the Bible tells us, yes, it is. Because again, you can't just take Genesis 1 and 2 out of there, but look at, uh, look at the rest of the Bible. If you, if you read in 1 Chronicles chapter 1 and in Luke chapter 3, they're a, a set of genealogies. Now, for most of us, when we're, if you're in a, like a daily Bible reading program, which you should be, and uh, you're reading through genealogies, it can just get tiring. And there's a lot of names and it's super confusing. And a lot of times we just kind of skip over that. But we need to, we need to s stop and think about it. Okay, what's happening? In First Chronicles chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3, they are mirroring the genealogies 
from the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And they're doing so as if this is real history, as if this really did happen. In fact, in Luke, when it gets all the way back, it goes from Jesus to Adam. And it says Adam was the son of God. As if, with the, as if Luke thought that he was talking about a real history of a real person, of people who really did live, and when he gets to Adam, he just says the son of God because he was created by God. Now, <clears throat> what else? Jesus trusted Genesis 1 through 11. To me, you could probably stop with this, right? If we're talking about the Bible and, we're, and Jesus is quoting the Genesis 1 through 11, then he, he probably trusted it, right? And if it was good enough for Jesus, it's probably good enough for us. But look at this. Jesus quotes Genesis 1 through 11 25 times. He even quotes the first two chapters of Genesis. This is a big deal. Now, it's not just a big deal because, oh, cool, look, Jesus is quoting this. It means he had the Bible. But he's trusting it as historically reliable, right? That's, a, that's really important for us to think about. In fact, in his teaching on divorce, look at what he says. This is in Mark chapter 10. And Jesus said to them, oh, they asked, basically, can we just get a divorce for any reason? He says, um, because of your hardness of heart, he, Moses, wrote to you this commandment uh, that you could divorce your wife. But look at this. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Whoa, okay. He doesn't just say at creation. He doesn't just say at beginning. He says, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And I don't know if you noticed this, but there's little tiny quotes there, male and female. And then it says, therefore, another little quote, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, end quote. What's he quoting? He's quoting Genesis 2:24 as if it really did happen in history. Do you see that? So Jesus thinks that Genesis 1 through 11 really did happen, that it was real history. It really took place. He, ta- he refers to that as at the beginning of creation and then quotes Genesis chapter 2. This validates Genesis chapter 2 as history. Do you guys see that? That's a big deal. And not just Jesus, but what about the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul who wrote like a third of the New Testament, he quotes the first 11 chapters of Genesis all the time. And in specific detail, like in 1 Corinthians 11, he references back to a woman being made from man as if that really did happen. Now let's time out for just a second. Is it crazy to believe that there is a big, all-powerful creator God who created everything that we see? An invisible God who created visible stuff? Is that crazy? Yeah, that's a big, that's a, that's a, that's a difficult thing to believe. Is it difficult to believe that this God took a rib out of a man and made it into a woman? Yes. Let's just, un- let me understand. This is, these are big things. Why? Because these are called miracles, right? So that's, that is, I can understand this is hard to believe, but what we're going to see is this makes sense. At least it makes sense logically. An immaterial God creating the material world, it makes sense. And if he, if he can make man out of the dust of ground, can he make a woman out of a rim? Sure he can. This is, we're talking the creator, M- miraculous. The point, though, I want to I drive through right now is that Paul believed that happened. Paul believed that happened. In 2 Corinthians 11.3, he refers back to the serpent deceiving Eve. Is it crazy to think about a snake deceiving a woman into eating a fruit? Yep. But Paul believed it happened. So we can't just, you know, if we can't just say, oh, I believe all the New Testament, but that first 11 chapters of Genesis, I don't know. You got to. Because Jesus and Paul are affirming the historical reliability of the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And then in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, he talks about Adam being formed first, um, then Eve, and then Eve being deceived. So, I mean, does, does the Apostle Paul think that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are reliable, true history? Yeah, he does. And then for me, the, one of the biggest things is in Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, this is Paul is articulating the gospel and explaining how in Adam everybody has died and how in Christ all can be made alive. All right? Now, in doing this, he is, this only makes sense. This hinges on Adam being the real biological father of all mankind, right? Because to say that we're in Adam is that we've all descended from Adam. Now, people who try to promote this type of a theistic evolution, that maybe evolution is probably true and God just kind of ordered it, brought it around, right? 
the, the guy who writes, who's written the most about this guy named Francis Collins wrote a book called The Language of God. I mean, yeah, The Language of God, that seems right. Super smart dude. But he said that Adam and Eve were probably just two of like a thousand homo sapiens that were running around that God um, made in his image by having a special relationship with them. Well, the problem with that is then, then we would not all be descended from Adam, which means we would not all be underneath Adam's sin, which means we would not all be open to Christ's righteousness. You see that? That's a big deal. According in Romans chapter 5, look at it some other time, but it breaks down. Christ's sacrifice is to affect all the people who are in Adam. And if we're not all in Adam, then it breaks down. Adam has to be the biological head of, of all of us, right? So what we, what we need to understand is if we're trying to deny the historicity of the creation account, then we're going against Jesus and Paul, right? That's a big deal. Now, some people say, well, it's talking about days in creation, and, and that could just mean, the word day could mean a lot of different things. It could be a lot more than just one day. Well, of course it can, right? Can day mean more than just a 24-hour period? Yeah, absolutely. Even in English, we see that, right? I mean, we, we talk about the day of the Lord, which could mean an actual day. It could mean an actual moment. It could be a period of time where, where, uh, where Jesus is ruling, or it could be the inauguration of a period of time that Jesus is ruling. So it's a, kind of ambiguous to say day of the Lord. Or if I say back in the day, you guys all know I mean the 90s. Right? The 90s? Come on, 1992? You know, in the 90s, come on. We're talking Vanilla Ice, MC Hammer, who was too legit to quit. Right? You guys, you guys know exactly. You know what I'm talking Hammer time. We got to pray just to make it today. That's why we pray. Pray. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? No? In the 90s, did you know that in the, ni- the 90s were marked by technological advances that have never been seen before? Do, do you remember? They made this material in the 90s. It was called Hypercolor by Genera. <laughs> Are you kidding me? It was a shirt that when it got hot, changed colors. That's exactly right. I'm going to go play basketball. I got on my gray shirt. Wait, what's going on? His shirt's turning blue. That's amazing. <laughs> back, I mean, we're talking back in the day. Wow. Starter jackets, members only jackets. Come on. Uh, surf style jackets, you remember? I wish I had one. They were so cool. Now all these things can be bought at thrift stores. I mean, those are a huge deal. Back in the 90s, people were getting killed over starter jackets. And now nobody wants a starter jacket. You could buy them at Walmart. I know it's so sad. They were like $250 back in the day. Anyway, so my point is that we can say back in the day, and you know that I don't mean a 24-hour period, right? I mean a decade, the golden age. Anyway, <laughs> um, but, but here's the thing. When we, what, what has to determine that? Even, when, even in normal conversations in English, right? What determines that? Context, right? Now, if I said... Man, three days ago, I'm, you guys aren't thinking, does he mean the 90s, three, 30 years? No, of course not, right? That's silly. So let's look. The uh, passage that people use to, to, to say, oh, well, for the Lord, a day is a thousand years, is Second Peter. In Second Peter chapter 3, it's talking about um, that no one really believes that, that Peter is trying to put together a mathematical equation to say that for God, a day is a thousand years, right? It says, it says, but do not overlook this fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, as a thousand years is as one day, right? He's not really trying to make a mathematical equation. He's not saying that when the Lord says day, he means thousand years, because otherwise that'd be crazy. Like Noah, right? 40,000 years it rained. Jonah in the belly of a fish for 3,000 years. And then Jesus fasted, 40,000, that's miraculous. He went 40,000 years without anything to eat or drink, right? That's crazy. No one thinks that. But what is, what is this trying to say? Is it trying to say, hey guys, when God says a thousand years, he means a day? No, he's saying that God's going to fulfill his promises. God is going to fulfill his promises. A, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. Like for me, if I make a promise to you that I'm going to do something tomorrow, there's a good chance that I'm going to remember and keep that promise. If I say, a thousand years from now, no way, right? 
I won't be alive. But for God, a thousand years is like a day. If he says it's going to happen, it doesn't matter if it's a day. It doesn't matter if it's a thousand years. That's what he's trying to talk about, right? Um, so then, but what, what we really want to know is what did Moses mean in Genesis chapter 1, right? And the best way to do a word study in the Bible is to look at the way that specific authors use the same word. And especially if you can have an author referring back to something else that he wrote, wouldn't it be amazing if we had a time when Moses was writing in a different place, talking about Genesis 1, and mentioned the days of creation, that would be really helpful and insightful. Well, we have it. We have it two times. In, in Exodus 20, this is Moses writing Exodus 20, the establishment of the Ten Commandments, all right? This is Moses writing. Moses wrote Exodus. Moses also wrote Genesis. He says this, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor. Does he mean 6,000 years? No. No. Does he mean six periods of an indeterminable amount of time? No. He means work for six days, right? And do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. Honor you should not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, or your male servant, or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourners within your gates. Well, why? For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Isn't that fascinating? Because could the Lord have just created everything in one instant? Sure he could. But he created in such a way to give us a cycle of weeks and a cycle of work and rest. Isn't that fascinating? And so Moses is saying, just like God works for six days, so you too work for six days and rest on the seventh. It looks like Moses, who wrote Exodus and Genesis, believes that the six days... No, actually six days. He says it again in Exodus 31. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and refreshed. So Moses thinks that Genesis 1 is referring to actual days, right? So when we're looking at this for, look, to close out the Bible part, right? The Bible's interconnected. It's not just the beginning of the Bible that talks about creation. All of the Bible refers back to creation. Read through the Psalms, right? Look at what Jesus said. Look at what Paul said. We're referring back to creation. So in the Bible, not just at the beginning, but all throughout the Bible, attests to the historical reliability of the beginning of it, right? Of Genesis 1 through 11. When we talk about days. Moses himself says this is six days, all right? Great. Now let's look at science, right? So if we're going to believe the Bible, we have to hold to a doctrine of creation. I really believe that. Now we look at science. What does science have to say? Is, this, is science really? Now, okay, there's a book that you guys could read that is really, really difficult to read. I'm just letting you know that right now. But it's by a guy named Alvin Plantinga. It's called Where the Conflict Really Lies. And part of me is super encouraged by the fact that it's hard to understand because it means that there are super brilliant Christians out there. Um, who, uh, who are saying things that I don't even get. But this guy, I mean, he's the, uh, he's the chairman of philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. So a pretty smart guy. And uh, he's saying that, he's talking about where the conflict really lies. And he says the conflict doesn't lie between evolution and Christianity. He says the problem lies between evolution and naturalism. He's saying that the naturalistic world the naturalistic uh, worldview framework can't even account for the order that, was, uh, that would be necessary in evolution, which is fascinating, right? And so, but what about this? What, is, what does the universe look like? What is science trying to tell us? One is that the universe had a beginning. Now, for most of you, you might be just thinking, okay, no, big deal, so what? Well, the, the universe had to have a beginning. The material world, all of the stuff had to have a beginning. We live in a universe that is based on dependent relationships, and you go all the way back, 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 back. There had to be a start of it. There had to be a start of, of matter and space and time as we know it. There had to be a beginning. Now, this is crazy because up until like the 50s and 60s, it was okay to say that the universe had always existed. But when science and philosophy both collided together to tell us, oh, no, there had to be a beginning of the universe, it was atheists that got scared. Because they thought, whoa, oh if there was a time when there was nothing, and now there's everything, and then somebody had to start it. Because let's think about it. Like, so what we're talking about is the material world, right? Material universe. Had to come into, what, there was a time when there was nothing, and now there's something. So why is there something rather than nothing? Why? Well, for a Christian, we believed that there is a, an immaterial, meaning God is not made of stuff like we think of it. He's immaterial. He's transcendent, which means he's above time. 
right? He's immaterial and transcendent, all-powerful. We talked about this this morning in the service. All-powerful, and he's a person. He's a being who created everything that we have in front of us. Now, you might think, well, that's hard to believe. Yeah, but it's logical. It makes sense. If the material world had to have a beginning, then it had to come from something that's immaterial and all-powerful and a person because it's people. It's agents that do things, all right? And what about, you know, we talk about the Big Bang. Well, the Big Bang actually makes more sense with creation because there has to be somebody to start it. There has to be somebody who initiated the singularity that exploded into everything we have now, right? That makes more sense with the creator God because the Big Bang isn't really a beginning on its own, right? Because you have this hot, small, dense super force. Well, where did that come from, right? You guys need to get this. You guys need to understand that the academic world is bankrupt when it comes to a beginning of the universe, right? Some of the answers that are out there, if you look at uh, Richard Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, super cool, trendy British atheist, who sounds smart because he's British. And when asked about life on this planet, he says, oh, perhaps it was seeded here by extraterrestrials. And you're like, man, that sounds so smart. He's British, he said extraterrestrials. He's right. And then you start, yeah, right? And then you realize, wait a second. Did he just say aliens? Time out. We came from aliens? Does that give us the answer, though? No, of course not, because then you have to ask, hey, Richard, where'd those aliens come from? That's not an answer for a beginning, right? There's a guy named Lawrence Krauss. He started an organization called the Origins Foundation, a professor at Arizona State University. I mean, he's a quantum physicist, smart guy, but he got too smart for his own good. He wrote a book called A Universe Out of Nothing and is saying that what we know now is that we've changed the definition by what we mean of something and nothing. Isn't that easy? Because you can talk about nothing as if it's something, perhaps it's something that can do everything. What, how, what created the universe? Nothing did. Oh, just because you can put it as the subject of a sentence doesn't mean it can do that, right? Because you guys know what nothing is? No thing, right. Nothing. What can nothing do? Nothing. You can't actually give attributes to nothing because it's nothing. It's not a thing that you can even talk about. But we're talking about nothing. Uh, he wrote a book about nothing. In fact, what he says, and th- to me is hilarious, right? Because, I mean, it's just, I can't, it's, he's very smart. He's smarter than I am. But he said that what nothing is, we, he says that nothing in the past, we used to think of it like in the Bible as a void, something that was empty, that was nothing there. But now we know, he says, but our definition has changed about what we, what we talk about when we say nothing. He said, now we know that nothing is a virtual, as a, yeah, a, as a brew of virtual particles popping in and out of existence on a time scale so short we can't see them. So there's nothing there, but actually lots of stuff is happening. I know. I mean, that's a quote. That's what he said. Bubbling brew of virtual particles popping in and out of an existence on a time scale so short you can't see them, so there's nothing there, but actually lots of stuff is happening. And he said that type of nothing is unstable, as if that type of nothing... I mean, could you imagine we're talking about different types of nothing? <laughs> that type of nothing can make everything? I mean, that's crazy. Because again... Does that answer the question? No, it doesn't. Because what he's just by cha- just by saying that nothing, the definition of nothing has changed. We now are realizing that nothing is something, and so if there had to be a time when there was nothing, then that something doesn't count either. I know that was really confusing, but so is he. In fact, uh, <laughs> you guys realize that uh, Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin, in his autobiography, said that you would have to call him a theist. Because even, the, the, even if you held to a belief in biological evolution, it doesn't have a beginning. It, it starts with stuff, right? It starts with stuff. But we're talking about the universe having a beginning. There's a philosophical law that says that anything that began to exist had a cause, right? You guys get that? Anything that begins to exist has a cause. And we now know that the universe began to exist. So what does that mean? The universe had to have a cause. What? And that cause has to be all-powerful, immaterial, 
transcendent, and a being. Which if you get those four things, you're really close to talking about the creator God of the Bible, right? And that's where science points us. It points us to there being a, an immaterial, transcendent, all-powerful being. And let's look at this. Let's look at the universe that we live in right now, right? The universe we live in exhibits finely tuned design. I mean, so finely tuned. And evolution can't explain this because what we're seeing is we're seeing, I mean, precision and order out of randomness and disorder. Well, the world doesn't work that way, right? If the world worked that way, then my kid's room would always be spotless. But it's not. It just continues, spurs on into perpetual anarchy, right? Disorder. I mean, we know this, right? The universe is tending towards disorder, right? Evolution can't make everything more and more ordered. It doesn't make sense. The universe doesn't work that way. But the problem is, is that everybody, Christian and non-Christian, when people look at the universe, they talk about its apparent design. Apparent. I mean, you even have scholars who are so bought into naturalism that they can't see that there has to be a God. They'll say, I, the crazy thing is everywhere we look, it looks like the universe is designed, but it's not. And that's what's crazy, you know? How can this be? It can't, right? Um, look at this. In, uh, 19, in, uh, in 1867, we're talking cutting edge technology here. Nothing but the newest for you guys. There's a guy named William Paley, and he had a great illustration about a watch in the woods. And this is it's so good that we don't need to think of a new one, right? He said this, imagine you're walking in the woods. Have you guys ever walked in the woods? Yes, okay, no one? All right, perfect, it's fine. I've done it, I'll tell you my experience. <clears throat> he said, suppose you're walking in the woods and you come across a rock. And now, if you just see a rock in the woods, kind of matches the other rocks around you, you think, this could be here forever right? Is there, any, is there anything that you just look around and you're like, well, this is, it's not out of place. You just think, yeah, there's a rock in the woods. It's fine. But suppose you're walking in the same woods and you come across a watch. And remember, at this time, uh, in the 1800s, the wa this watch would have been made of like metal and glass. And, if, and he looked at it and he realized, wait a second, it's conveying information. You know, it's 1127. And that's exactly, it, there's information on this that corresponds to what time of day it is. And I open it up and I realize that there's all sorts of, of springs and wheels and cogs that are all perfectly fitting together to give me this type of information. Now, would you then be able to say, this has been here forever? Well, no, especially because it's still working, which means that somebody have had to have wound it within a couple hours from then. And it's, he's like, man, we see this and we automatically realize there has to be a watchmaker somewhere right? And this is just a watch, right? But what about the universe? The universe, every aspect of it exhibits this type of finely tuned design. Um, let's look at, uh, at one of the most amazing things in all of nature. Look at the complexity. Do you guys, you guys realize how amazing this is? We're talking about almost 20 rocks that are almost in a circle. Have you ever seen anything more complicated? Probably not, not unless you're a quantum physicist. Now, what's fascinating, this is Stonehenge. And when people go, I mean, thousands of people every year go to visit Stonehenge. I would go if I was in England, because why not, right? It's rocks in a circle. I've never seen anything like this in my life. It's so amazing. And when you go there, you'll find out that this is one of the natural wonders of the world, that this used to just be a big mountain, and through millions of years of erosion and wind and rain, it carved out these rocks that are almost in a circle, right? This, do you guys realize this is just millions of years of wind and rain? And now everybody's like, no, Zach, you're an idiot. Right, because if you go visit Stonehenge, do you know what the... What's, what's the question everybody asks when they see this? <laughs> Who did that? Right? And we say that because of its amazing complexity. No. We say it because it's a bunch of rocks in a circle. <laughs> and we see this and we know automatically, intuitively, every one of you thinks, who did that? Who put that there? Isn't that crazy? Do you realize how messed up our world is? Where we can see this and say, 
That's a sign of design. But we can see the, the single cell, the DNA, your, the human body, and say, That's, this just happened naturally, random events plus time plus chance. Is that crazy? I mean, to me, that blows me away. But you know that if you, if you gave, if you had endless resources at your disposal, and you had the sharpest engineers and biologists on the planet, and you gave them a project to make, to just replicate the human hand, right, with all the bells and whistles, that, it, that has the dexterity to play the piano, right? Not mine, obviously, but, you know, to be able to have an automatic healing mechanism to where if it's cut open, it'll heal itself. It'll clot its blood and heal itself. To if you work it so hard in one place, it'll get calluses to protect itself. With fingernails. I mean fingernails. So that you can scratch and pick up dimes, you know? You know that if you gave, if you had unlimited resources, that... The, the best mechanics and biologists in the world can't come up with something like that on purpose, intentionally. But we say it just happened accidentally. Just random events plus time plus chance. Did you guys realize? And that's not, I mean, the, the hand is super complicated, but not as complicated as your eye. Have you ever read what, the, what naturalist biologists say about the evolution of the human eye? They just say, oh, well, you know, there was this uh, patch of skin that just was kind of a little bit more sensitive to light than the other ones. And it just slowly over generations and generations evolved into what we have now. Really. That's crazy. That's unbelievable. Let's look at this. Um, In addition to uh, being finely tuned, we see in the universe what's called specified, I know this is going to be super nerdy, specified irreducible complexity. That that it's so complex, interconnected pieces inside that each individual part only makes sense in its relationship to the whole working together so that it couldn't have evolved in little tiny um, uh, mutations, slight successive changes. In fact, look at this quote from Darwin in The Origin of Species. He says, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down, but I can find no such case. Yeah, because he didn't know what an electron microscope was. I'm telling you, if, if Darwin lived 150 years later than he did, he never would have come up with this theory of evolution, never would have promoted the theory of evolution. It was around a little bit before he was there, but he's the one who really added to it. Because we, once we have, with the addition of technology, I mean, we're realizing this. Look at this one quote. A single cell. Remember, Darwin's whole point was that <clears throat> because we see changes in um, a species that we can have, then that means that it's going to change from one species to the next, which means that all the species from here back to the beginning have come from just changes and changes and changes all the way down to one simple Single cell, right? The simple single-celled organism. I remember even when I was growing up, um, we would hear about the simple single-celled organism, right? It's simple. Oh, it's just one cell. How, sim- how hard could that be? Okay, we now know that a single cell is seethingly complex, containing maybe, I don't know, 100 million proteins of 20,000 different types. It, we're talking about the single cell, right? It's a factory that contains an elaborate network of interlocking assembly lines in the single cell. So what we're realizing is that Darwin was right in saying that if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which couldn't be formed by successive, uh, slight successive modifications, his theory would break down. And now he reals, realize that every organism is more complex. Every organism made up of cells. You guys realize that if, that if, you, were, if you were a you know, biologist, you could take one square foot of your yard and write for the rest of your life about what's happening in there. Isn't that crazy? That was crazy. Look at this. We also uh, find in, in nature what we call the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle is not something that was coined by Christians, but by non-believers. We talked about how the world we look The world we live in looks as if it was designed for human life. It looks that way, but then they would say, of course it's not. Look at these quotes. Uh, Freeman Dyson says, I'm sure you guys have all heard of him. You probably read Disturbing the Universe every night before you go to bed. But he says this, 
as we look out into the universe and identify the many accidents of physics and astronomy that have worked together to our benefit, it almost seems as if the universe must in some sense have known we were coming. Agreed. Um, an astrophysicist, George Greenstein, says this, as we survey all the evidence, the thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency, or rather agency with a capital A, must be involved. Is it possible that suddenly... Without intending to, we have stumbled upon scientific proof for the existence of a supreme being. Was it God who stepped in and so providentially created the cosmos for our benefit? Yes. You're on the right track. Right? You realize that for these guys, they're so bought into this methodological naturalism that, they, that their, their brain can only work in a closed box. There is no supernatural that they can't say. And even, it looks like there's a creator, but we know there can't be. Um, let's look at evolution real quick. Um, We've already gone a little too long. I'm just going to fly through this. Uh, we, everybody believes that there is a type of evolution that takes place. We call it microevolution. We call it adaptation or variation within the species, right? I mean, this is what Darwin spent his, all his life working for, right? We've got these finches, which are a little bird, that their beaks would change size based on the food source available to them, either get longer, skinnier, bigger, and fatter. Right, we see this happening all the time. Now, his, his failure was that he believed that because we see uh, adaptation within the species, because we see microevolution, that, that would then lead to a, a jump, a shift, a going to another species, right? Well, the problem is you can still go to the islands where, um, where Darwin uh, studied these finches. And what we realize is that at least two times since Darwin uh, studied that the finches have gone through cycles of actually changing their beaks again, two different cycles, Right, but you know what the finches haven't done? Yeah, become alligators or something else. What we're seeing is the evolution within the species stays within the species. In fact, when we see mutations, where you know basically like a big step, the mutations are always negative. And mutations are always result in a lack, a loss of genetic information because people will be like, well, these finches, they can no longer mate with the original finches that came from the mainland. And that's actually bad. That's not aiding in survival. We're talking about every time mutations happen, it loses genetic information. And so we think about this, look at the fossil record. In the fossil record, if, 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 if evolution is true, right, that if we had a single cell that had these, all these little tiny changes slowly that turned into all the species that we have now, then the fossil record should back it up. In fact, what we should have in the fossil record should be 99.9% intermediate species, right? Well, if we look at the fossils that we have, they all look like fully formed species that resemble things that are around now. Whoa. That was such a big deal that in the 80s, they came up with this idea of punctuated equilibrium. A punctuated equilibrium was the idea that um, basically uh, evolution would uh, store up genetic information on how, they wa how a species needed to change. And just instead of having slight changes every generation, it would just store it up for generation, 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 then explode and have, have huge changes um, within the lifetime of one, uh, of, of one organism. Well, that's not evolution. That, it helps us understand why the fossil record doesn't have intermediate species, but it's also breaking every rule of evolution. And then we think about even the second law of thermodynamics. Two things to look at in the second law of thermodynamics, which means that, you know, the second law of thermo thermodynamics states that everything is tending towards disorder, or what they call entropy. Everything is tending towards disorder. Everything is getting worse. We have a scientific law that says everything's getting worse and a scientific theory that says everything's getting better. Which one trumps the other? The law, Right? And we see it happening. We don't see evolution happening. But we do see entropy. We do see disorder. And now that we also, the second thing is we need to realize that if everything's tending towards disorder, then if we go backwards in time, there had to be a time of zero entropy. As if the world was created good. What? See that? There has to be. If everything's getting worse and worse and worse, then if you work backwards, you had to have, have a time of 100% of zero entropy, everything good. Well, that kind of looks like the Bible. So well, let's think about it. So what we need to realize is when we look at the Bible, we see that the Bible over and over backs up the story of creation. It just does, all over. Jesus, Paul, Moses backs it up. And then we look at science. Science is showing us, I mean, it was Galileo that said that God revealed himself in two different books, the book of Scripture and the book of nature. And what we're seeing is that those books don't contradict each other. The more that we realize about God's creation, it just should help us 
to love and appreciate God more. In fact, that's why the scientific revolution took place. The scientific revolution took place because you had a bunch of people who, I mean, and it's, it's fascinating that the scientific revelation took place shortly, uh, like shortly after the Protestant Reformation because you had a renewed understanding of the glory of God. And the scientific revol- the revolution was powered by believers who were trying to understand God's creation so they could praise God more. So don't be afraid of scientific inquiry, right? Don't be afraid of scientific inquiry. Read, study, seek out answers, and trust that, that God's word is going to be proven true. And that we, as believers, we need to be the ones who are most committed to understanding the world in which we live in because it's God's world that he created, all right? So let me pray for us. We've got 20 minutes until lunch. Gracious Father, please help us to solidify our faith Challenge us with your truth, uh, both from your word and creation, and help us understand how it fits together. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you all.